Hello, I'm Adnan Mahmutovic, and this is Love and Its Discontents podcast. It is a great pleasure to welcome Peter Scott Adamson, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Munich. Aside from writing multiple articles, monographs, and edited books, he received the Philip Leverholm Prize in 2003 for outstanding research achievements. In 2020, he received Schelling Prize for work on multiculturalism in a historical perspective. Since 2010, he has been the host of an absolutely amazing podcast called History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, which has more than 400 episodes, and I cannot hype it up enough. Professor Adamson, uh, judging from his podcast, seems to be a platonic lover of puns, giraffes, and Buster Keaton and is therefore a perfect guest for an episode on love. Peter, you are most welcome to Love and Its Discontents. Thanks so much for having me on. Nice to be here. Um, so for this episode, I invited you to speak of uh, mainly of Plato's notion of love and Aristotle as well. So essentially in Greek, Greek philosophy. But I, I do want us to start a bit earlier with the pre-Socratic Empedocles, if I, uh, if I pronounce this right. So uh, Empedocles had these uh, notions of love and strife. And also the four roots or the four elements. Uh, so it's fire, air, water, and earth. And I found this poem which seems to invoke love as some kind of a force uh, uh, which brings everything together, some kind of a fifth element. And the poem, uh, which was in Brad Inwood's uh, translation, goes like this. And these things never cease from constantly alternating at one time all coming together by love into one, and at another time again all being born apart separately by the hostility of strife. So I wonder if we can start there and discuss a little bit of, you know, how, you know, of all the pre-Socratics, and you discuss this in your uh, podcast, uh, this is the one that focuses on love quite, quite a lot. So I wonder if you could... Uh, elaborate on this one a bit. Sure. Well, Empedocles, as you say, is a pre-Socratic philosopher. So we're obviously before Socrates here, before Plato and Aristotle. So he's one of the oldest philosophers in the Greek tradition. And he has this poem, which is not completely preserved. It's, so we have extensive fragments of it that are preserved in later authors like Aristotle and also late ancient commentators on Aristotle. Also, some fragments of it were found in a papyrus in France uh, about 20 years ago, I think, or something. So, like, recently, they found more material that belongs to the poem, which was very exciting. And actually, my colleague, Oliver Primavesi, here in Munich, is one of the people who worked on that quite a lot. So, what the cosmology tells us is that the world is constructed out of the famous four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, as you said. But then there are these two other forces, you might call them, which seem to be independently present in the cosmos uh, as somehow operating on the four elements. So we have love and strife. And love and strife are responsible for generating a cyclical process in which the elements first come together and are then separated. So you have to imagine that there's a kind of um, ever repeating history going on here that takes thousands of years to unfold in which sometimes love has the over hand and sometimes strife does. And then in between when they're kind of struggling against each other, we have a more complicated universe in which the elements have been brought together to some extent, but not completely. So let me spell out what that, all that would imply. So if you imagine the situation where love reigns supreme 
um, which I guess is, isn't that a Coltrane album? Love. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Love so Supreme, that, yes. I, I didn't intend that when I said it, but when it came out of my mouth, I realized, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. I think I'm, puns come to you naturally. Yeah, I think you, don't need to, yeah. you don't need to think about it. I don't it. even have to try anymore. Yeah. Right? Okay, so when Love Reigns Supreme, what we've got is that the four elements have been completely sort of woven together or combined, mixed. And so what you have is a, an undifferentiated sphere, which is completely homogeneous. And that actually lasts for a long time, according to Empedocles. But then strife starts to rise to ascendancy, and that involves taking the elements apart. And what strife is ultimately trying to do, to speak in an anthropomorphic way, is to completely separate the elements. So all the way at the other end of the cosmic cycle, what you have is that the four elements have been completely sifted apart and they just exist in concentric layers. So fire on the outside, then air, then water, then earth at the middle, right? So it would be like a very boring cosmos, not as boring as the sphere. Although maybe Empedocles doesn't think it's boring because he calls the sphere a god. So maybe in some sense, like the sphere is a really amazing and perhaps the best uh, kind of condition for the universe to be in. But from the, from the point of view of it being complicated, it's not interesting. The period where strife is in complete control is more complex, but not very much because you just have these four layers of elements. It's in the middle when things are being sifted apart or put back together that you have uh, the possibility of, for example, animals arising. And this is something Empedocles talks about in some detail. So he talks about the way that when the elements are sort of um, put together by love. So if you imagine these four concentric spheres of elements, this, and then love starts like pushing them together, what you'll get is random combinations and mixtures, which can then themselves combine and form limbs of animals. And yet there's this amazing uh, kind of description of limbs of animals, like eyes and arms kind of wandering around without whole bodies to attach to. Because the first thing you would get, so his thought is, well, the first thing you'd get is some mixed, mixed elements. And then you'd get more complicated mixtures like flesh or bone. And then when they mix, when love mixes those together, you would get things like eyes, maybe. And then when those, the eyes and arms and so on get mixed together, then you get whole animals. And he says that the animals that arise from this process, which are kind of fitted to survive, they're the ones that survive and we can see them today. So sometimes people have, I think, unjustifiably compared this to a kind of evolutionary theory. The reason it's unjustifiable is that he, he doesn't seem to suggest that they, they survive because they're fit in the sense of being able to outcompete other animals. It's more like they're the right animals or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or they're able to reproduce. Maybe he does have that in mind. Aristotle criticizes this heavily on the grounds that nature can't arise in this just kind of happenstance or chancy way. Rather, he thinks that nature, since it's so stable and regular, it must um, follow sort of like patterns of repeated species propagation that are not just chancy. But Empedocles thinks that you just get some animals like along the way while you're combining the, the ingredients together. So here, love is very much like a cosmic force, which is for putting things together. So it's not like, you know, someone falling in love with someone else. Although yes. uh, if you think about it, um, part of what he has in mind here is that there's a parallel or maybe even partial identity between the love that say two people feel for each other and the love that's involved in combining these elements. And of course, both re result in reproduction, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, it does have uh some kind of uh, resemblance or some reference to the myth of, uh, let's say, human beings being split in two and that love is that which brings the two halves together and strife is that which to uh, tears them apart uh, or, or the force that is. Uh, so, so, I mean, even in that, it, it seems to... There seems to be a resonance, but I really like this idea that uh, that it's in the middle, like in the in in between states, that the things are really interesting. Uh, so when it's uh, kind of purely perfect in love uh, or purely strife, that's not so interesting. So so it's there in the middle where it's still kind of 
things are um, the storytelling of the creation is is going on. So that's where it's really interesting for him. So uh, yeah, there's actually I, I a scholarly controversy yeah. about whether the situation we're witnessing now is a period of rising strife or a period of rising love. So are things getting, as it were, better? Like, are we heading towards the sphere? Or, or are things being pulled apart and think, are we going to be like all <laughs> torn to pieces eventually? Yes. Yeah. And it's not okay. quite well, clear from the poem, which is It's the not case. quite clear from the poem, yeah. That is uh, that is absolutely uh, amazing. I'm kind of surprised that, you know, Marvel, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe hasn't used this enough yeah? <laughs> In, in the, perhaps in the latest uh, uh, Thor, Love and Thunder or something like that, because they, they like to combine these uh, old mythologies and, and philosophies. So yeah, Strife would be a I'll, good supervillain. It would be a good supervillain and you know how love com conquers. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, there's so much potential for, uh, for uh, cool storytelling there. Um, I, uh, before you go to Plato, I just want to ask you if, um, so, uh, if, for instance, if I um, follow your um, your summaries of these philosophers, obviously, you would normally kind of highlight that which is central to to a philosopher. Uh, uh, but is there a continuation? Like, is there? A, uh, is it only? Empedocles focuses so much on this this force of love, and then we have nothing really until uh, Plato. Or is there is some some kind of a development, uh, or is it only later with Plato that we get uh, at least some philosophy on love? That's an interesting question. I guess Empedocles is the pre-Socratic who leaps to mind, who talks about love. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, in some ways, what he's talking about resonates with what other pre-Socratics were thinking about. Um, so for example, Parmenides, the famous Parmenides, who mm -hmm. also wrote a poem about philosophy in which he defends a position according to which there's only one thing, namely being. So this is often called monism in philosophy. Uh, and it's, he's not the only monist, right? There's Indian classical Indian monism, like in the Vedanta tradition, there's Spinoza who's some kind of monist. Um, but, uh, Parmenides monism is very kind of concrete because he, when he describes what being is like, he says that it can't be differentiated. And so it should be a balanced sphere. And he actually uses mm -hmm. the word sphere, just like Empedocles did. It's the Greek word is actually spheros. So it's the same word. So you might say, think that there's some kind of relationship between what Empedocles is talking about and what Parmenides was talking about, because they both have this kind of perfect unified sphere in their philosophy. But I don't mm. think that Parmenides talks extensively about love as such mm. in the poem. I'd have to double check that, but it doesn't ring any bells for me. No, I, uh, I, I see. Absolutely. It's just interesting to see what uh, you know, different philosophies kind of pick up on and what they continue uh, using and what they kind of leave behind. Uh, and to go <laughs> straight to Plato, obviously, because uh, I think everyone who doesn't actually even know who Plato is or Plato, who Plato was has heard the phrase platonic love. Uh, and as you yourself uh, explain, it's not quite what we mean, um, but that he meant what he, what we mean by that phrase uh, today. So uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about Plato and how he, how does he develop the theory of love? What is love in Platonic thought, and why does he even do it? I mean, what what's the role of love in in uh, his philosophy? Well, let's start with that thing about. Platonic love, just to clear that up. Mm. So we usually use the phrase platonic love to mean something like a loving friendship that's non-physical or non-sexual. And that is really something that goes back not to Plato, but to the Italian Renaissance. So you have thinkers like, for example, Marsilio Ficino, who are sensitive to the criticism of the platonic dialogues that they're rather interested in sex, and in particular sex between older men and younger boys, which for readers in the Italian Renaissance is a bit embarrassing. And in fact, there were some philosophers like uh, partisans of Aristotle who wanted to say that Aristotle is better than Plato, who had very heavily criticized Plato's dialogues for being kind of debauched and uh, filthy even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
or at least morally corrupt because they describe these pederastic relationships. So Platonists like Ficino were motivated to rescue Plato's reputation by saying, no, you don't, you've misunderstood. Whenever Plato talks about sexual relationships in his dialogues, it's always looking towards some kind of spiritual liberation from the body. So, so far from being about sex, it's actually trying to turn you away from sex and anything else that has to do with the body. And whatever is left of love after that would be platonic love. So this would be a purely spiritual, non-physical uh, kind of affection. So that's really where we get this idea of platonic love. Oh, yes, uh, and that, that's really interesting. And I've, I've also read um, papers and, and listened to, um, well, explanations. You know, the, when, when you read Plato and then uh, when you get these explanations where they try to say, uh, well, actually, you see these dialogues, so the Socratic dialogues, you see that whatever is being done here is that it's Plato actually trying to tackle this problem, which he doesn't actually like, which is the pederasty, uh, and uh, and that he has higher aspirations, so he still has to kind of deal with that, which is a part of the culture, uh, and somehow it kind of disassembles it, uh, and he he pulls out that which he is that 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 which he is after that is this kind of pure uh form of love that is uh, not kind of tied to the body and and that um so that this kind of toning down of pleasure that the uh, the toning down of uh what that the, the, the relationship between the older man and the uh, and the younger boy uh has to somehow eventually move beyond uh, sexual attraction and uh, and into something much much higher yeah, uh, mm. yeah and i i mean as you can see from that those modern readings ficino's interpretation does have some basis in the platonic dialogue so in particular mm. the, the the most important dialogue here is probably the symposium although mm. the phaedrus is also important and the symposium has a culminating speech it's not the last it's not the last speech in the dialogue but it's the second to last and it seems to be the kind of high point of the dialogue in which socrates talks about the lessons in love that he received from a female philosopher named diotima and diotima explains that when you fall in love with another person what you're experiencing is a kind of lower level uh, longing for something that ultimately can only be satisfied by the form of beauty itself. So there's this um, kind of progression, which is compared to a ladder, where you start by loving beautiful bodies, like the bodies of young boys. Um, actually, she's more interested than the, than the rest of the dialogue is in heterosexual sexuality, because she talks about wanting to um, kind of achieve immortality by reproducing, which obviously wouldn't be something you could do by, by having a sexual relationship between a man and a boy. And then she says that you should move on from these physical manifestations of love to love for things like beautiful laws and kind of work your way up to the most perfect instantiation of beauty there is, which of course is the platonic form of beauty. And she says that you can reproduce by giving birth in the beautiful itself, which seems to be something as a kind of metaphor for a philosophical grasp of the form of beauty. Um, so that would be a pretty strong argument for thinking that Plato's idea about love is what Ficino said it was. But it has to be said that there are a whole bunch of other speeches in the symposium too. And some of these speeches do things like praising man boy love in very vivid terms like for example there's a story about a famous um, military squadron where the soldiers were men and boys or, or maybe they're not men and boys but they're lovers so they're pairs of lovers and the idea is that these people were almost unbeatable in war because if you're fighting next to your lover then you would never run away or show weakness because it would be embarrassing in front of your beloved right yes. um so and, and the speaker of that dialogue is clearly saying that this is a great thing, right? So, I mean, you can, if you want, you can say, well, but Plato himself 
must have a different view of this because if we look at Diotima's speech, then obviously he thinks that sexual love is a kind of lower level thing or whatever. But it, I mean, with Plato, one always has to bear in mind that Plato never comes in and says, okay, well, here's what I think, right? Yeah. Unlike Vicino, when he's commenting on the symposium, Plato just gives us a whole bunch of different perspectives on love. Um, so I, I'm a little bit suspicious of readings that just take the Socrates slash Diotima speech to be like kind of the statement of Plato's official view or something, especially yes. because, as I say, it's not the last speech. The last speech is this other character named Alcibiades comes in and he's the most beautiful, young, talented boy in Athens. And now he's a young man, actually, at this point. And he gives a speech about Socrates and about his kind of erotic relationship with Socrates, which has remained unconsummated because Socrates has like this incredible willpower, which has enabled him to resist Alcibiades' advan advances, even though these, he's so hot, right? So Alcibiades yeah. is an incredibly attractive guy. And Socrates is so powerfully self-controlled that he can even lie down with Alcibiades in the same bed without, you know, engaging yeah. in any, um, you know, without getting along yes. famously, yes. as they sometimes say. Um, and I mean, that to me doesn't look like we're now supposed to be in a frame of mind where we've forgotten about sexuality, right? So again, there's, there's like some kind of very complicated thing going on here. And I think that that probably the most negative thing you could say about human sexuality from Plato's point of view is that it's a lower way of grasping something that can also be grasped in a higher way. But I don't think he dismisses it or thinks it's like something you need to get away from completely or something that he thinks is, is solely bad or anything like that. So we're not getting an ascetic message here from him. We're getting something more like a view that physical love is a lower version of something that's more valuable in a higher version. Mm. Indeed, and I, and I mean throughout uh, that um, that uh, I mean there is that part where uh, Socrates actually uh, engages in teaching someone how to actually properly seduce someone, how to actually properly develop a relationship with a younger boy, and so so it's kind of refine that that relationship. Uh, so it kind of combines that. So he's, he's a he. I, I, I don't remember the um, name of the character, but I remember he tells him. Uh, no, you you're doing that wrong. Let me let me show you some moves. Uh, kind Do of, you mean uh, the Phaedrus, maybe? So, in, that might be Phaedrus. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean the Phaedrus I mean, is so, probably yeah. the mm -hmm. other dialogue that leaps to mind. So when we talk about the erotic dialogues, the yes. two most important are the Symposium and the Phaedrus. And the Phaedrus is about a lot of different things, but one of them is that it's about um, it, it's it's a, it's about writing persuasive speech. And the persuasive speeches that we're talking about here are attempts to convince a boy to have an affair with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically someone has a speech and Socrates says, well, I have a, I have a better speech. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so if you want us to do yeah. someone, you should do it like this. Yeah. But, and then that dialogue also has this famous passage about, um, again, seeing the, uh, beloved, boy and the engagement between the two people as being a kind of starting place from which you can ascend to some kind of higher philosophical liberation mm -hmm. or wisdom or enlightenment or wisdom or something there is always that beauty and wisdom uh, yeah. uh kind of uh, lurking somewhere as uh that what what really is the difference between eros and philia mm -hmm. uh and so eros is Eros what we think of it today as kind of erotic law and philia as uh, the kind of purely spiritual law? What What is it in uh, Plato? Right. Actually, that's something I should have mentioned already. So when, mm -hmm. so far, when we've been talking about love in Plato, we've been talking about Eros. Mm -hmm. So the topic of the symposium, for example, the official topic of all the speeches that are given in the symposium is Eros, who is also a god, the name of a god. So one mm -hmm. of the things they talk about is praising Eros as a kind of divine force. And philia is different. So philia is, is I wouldn't say that it's um, spiritual love. It's more like just friendship. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's another dialogue called the Lysis, which is a, apparently an early work by Plato. And like other early dialogues, it just has Socrates sort of asking 
people what they think about some philosophical topic and then refuting them um, with arguments that are kind of fishy in some cases. So what's going on here is that he's talking to a couple of young Greek men and their friends, and he's sort of like trying to get to get clear with them on like what kinds of people can be friends with which other people and you know how does friendship work and so on and i actually don't think there's any immediate reason to think that for plato the topic of philia and the topic of eros are like two sides of one thing so i mean we have this word love which we can apply very indiscriminately like i love coffee you know or i love giraffes right yes um, yes. And it's a little bit weird to say that you love your friends, but people might, right? Mm. I mean, you might say it casually like, um, oh, I love Bob. He's so funny, <laughs> right? Yes. But that's kind of, that's just, that's more like I love coffee. But just generally speaking, we distinguish between uh, friendship and actual loving relationships. But on the other hand, we don't take loving relationships to be sexual. So for example, um, you know, you can love your family members who aren't your spouse or partner, right? Mm. Whereas in Greek, um, you'd be more likely to use the word philia for the relationship, for example, between a parent and a child. And you mm. wouldn't use the word eros for that. Whereas we would use the word love for both. We would, yes. Whereas we would say friendship for like, you know, oh, me and my mate and we go see sports together. That's my friend, right? Mm. So actually, like the difference between people often say, well, Eros means love and Philia means friendship, but actually it doesn't quite cut neatly in the same way. So really, Philia is non-sexual relationships that are affectionate. That's Philia. Mm -hmm. And Eros is affectionate relationships that are or have uh, are sexual or have a sexual component or have a very strong like mm -hmm. feeling of yearning or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Aristotle, okay. who we'll get on to, I guess. He talks about philia, but he does not talk about eros. Um, so actually, Plato's unusual in Greek philosophy, and then he's interested in both. He's interested in both philia and eros, but I guess he's more interested in eros. He writes more about eros than he does about philia. Indeed, yes, that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, I really like this. So, uh, um, you know, the philosophers once they've decided, you know, that something is uh, bad, they leave it behind, you know, uh, and. Uh, and here he is actually, as you say, putting a lot more, uh, a lot more thought into errors. And and later on, I mean, uh, uh, it's not something that, that we'll uh, talk about uh, here in this in this episode. But uh, sometimes um, I can see in uh, let's say um, some um, well devotional uh, poetry uh, that there is erotic imagery or errors can be used to actually also signify um, a love between a human and the divine or, or and, uh, and you know such uh, mm -hmm. uh, and even in um, something which I uh, sometimes emphasize in my own teaching when I uh, for instance use some passages from the Bible or the Quran where there seems to be uh, also some kind of an erotic charge uh, uh, embedded in the kind of love that we speak about when we speak about uh, humans and God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, medieval as, uh, mysticism yeah, is yeah. very strong. Medieval mysticism, there. yeah. So you have, mm -hmm. that's very strong in the Sufi tradition. Yes. And also you indeed. have uh, mystics, including women mystics in the medieval yes. Christian context, where they have very vividly sexualized descriptions mm -hmm. of their relationship to God. Like um, there's a, a Belgian mystic named Hadovich, who talks yes. about like coming together with God, like a bride and the bridegroom, right? Indeed. Sometimes Jesus is an important figure here. So you could have this kind of erotic attitude towards Jesus mm -hmm. as a male figure, right? Or, you know, just God as like a kind of male target of erotic longing. Although it has to be said that there are also male mystics who use erotic language for their relationship to God, mm -hmm. right? So that it's, it's not only uh, a kind of rhetorical move that a female author can use, but it's one that's particularly associated with female authors in the medieval period. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, one thing that I, I just remember just to kind of connect that is, uh, for instance, in the story of Joseph, 
uh, where uh, the seem to be the Joseph seems to be extremely attractive to a lot of women, uh, uh, partly because he is so close to God. So so it's uh, so it becomes like this presence of God in Joseph that becomes extremely attractive and erotic in in the way they are kind of. Uh, um, uh, sucked in, into his presence mm. uh so uh so for me that that's really quite interesting that's why i kind of like that uh that plato doesn't uh leave eros behind so that it's uh, uh it, it, both eros and philia and all that is is discussed uh, together um but can we um actually deduce anything <laughs> Of course, as you said, there's just uh, a lot of stories, a lot of different opinions on uh, uh, which they share. And Plato is kind of lurking there in the background and be trying to figure out, you know, what does he really think? Uh, does he think anything? Is that, does he lead us through these stories in a way so that we actually get something that is uh, concrete, some, some like uh, pure knowledge about love? Uh, I mean, that, that would be one question. The other is, why does he even talk about love? Uh, what, what is the role of love in all these, all these dialogues that he has? Mm -hmm. Why would he even go to that uh, topic? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, inevitably, this is a matter of speculation, right? Because we don't have Plato commenting on his dialogues and mm -hmm. explaining why he wrote them or what he was up to. So the dialogues, in some sense, have to speak for themselves. I think that one thing is that Plato writes about almost everything, or he certainly writes about a lot of things. So it's not like, I mean, okay, so he writes these dialogues about love and friendship, but he also writes about virtue and politics and mathematics. And I mean, he's quite a multifaceted author. So in some ways, I mean, I'm sort of tempted to say that this is like asking, why does Shakespeare write plays about love? Well, like, he's Shakespeare love it, you know, why wouldn't yes. he? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I think that maybe there's something more important than that, which is that, and, and this would apply to both Philia and Eros as a kind of topic of interest. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that philosophers should be very interested in is the whole phenomenon of desire and mm -hmm. motivation, right? So for example, um, if you're trying to show people why they should be pursuing wisdom, what you have to do is explain to them why the desire for wisdom is a desire they should have, or if they already have it, this one they should follow. And notice, by the way, this is actually built into the very word philosophy, right? Because the mm -hmm. philo part there is the same word as yes. philia. So mm -hmm. a philosopher is someone who has a law, uh, like a love for wisdom, mm -hmm. Sophia, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that one of the reasons why Plato is interested in this is that he wants to make sure that his portrait of the search for wisdom has a strong motivational component. Um, and you can also see this in other contexts where he doesn't actually talk about love, but he talks about the same topic of desire for wisdom. So for example, in the Republic, there's this famous story about how our souls have three parts. So we have a part that, that desires wisdom, which is reason. We have a part that desires honor, which is spirit. And we have a part that desires pleasure, which is appetite. Mm -hmm. And these, a lot of the Republic is about how these three parts of the soul or aspects of the soul should interact just like the diff And then he compares this to the way that the three classes in a city should interact and so on. But I, I think it's important to notice that he very strongly associates each part of the soul with a kind of desire. So reason for him isn't just like an ability to calculate or something or ability to kind of work stuff out. It's something that has a strong motivational component or aspect. Reason is sort of defined in terms of what it wants and what it wants is wisdom and truth. So it makes sense that when he's talking about love, it might be that the reason why he's doing that is that he's generally interested in the whole question of desire and motivation. And in particular, he's interested in the question of motivation for truth or knowledge or wisdom or whatever you want to call it. And so that would make sense of why he has this speech where Diotima describes the form of beauty as the ultimate target of love. So when you feel love for other things, what you're doing is feeling this kind of echo of something that in its most proper or paradigmatic sense is a love of wisdom or love of truth. 
does yes, a real philosopher's did. take on love in that sense. Yeah, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, if um, if you look at the history of philosophy, and you cover this quite a lot, especially later on when you come to the philosophy on, of uh, motivation, when, when you talk about those philosophers who had a really strong interest in where motivation comes from, uh, where desire comes from to actually do anything, what, what is it that moves me? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so, so th- this makes uh, uh, a lot of sense, and especially it also makes sense for me as uh, a writer because uh, for that to be a story, there has to be a desire, and uh, a desire, a conflict. Uh, a character wants something; he can, he or she cannot get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so something's in the way, and there is a whole process of going through obstacles or you know, troubles in order to get to that goal. Uh, and that's what constitutes a story. Otherwise, uh, well, if you take, as you mentioned Shakespeare, if you say, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, uh, they fell in love, they approached their families, the families said, good, good for you, you got our blessings. <laughs> the story ends right there. Very there is short no, play. The, yeah. It's a very short play, right? It's a happy ending, but, you know, we don't have a story. So there is a desire for something. So there is that kind of motivation. And I, and I like that it uh, uh, can be a desire for um, that lo- love doesn't have to be confined to a desire for another human being. It could be a desire for coffee or, or you know, something as silly as that. It, uh, but the, there is a sense of, uh, of uh, love being connected to motivation as such. Yeah, um, there's actually that, a yeah. philosophical puzzle lurking here, mm. which is something mm. that's explicitly discussed in some Renaissance dialogues about love, which are inspired by Plato. Mm. And the puzzle is the following. We've, as you just said, like love can be a good kind of basis for a narrative, right? So there's no narrative without conflict. There's no conflict without desire. And you framed that very much in terms of the desire being for something you don't have, right? So I I want coffee. Like I don't yet have the coffee, so I have to do something about it, right? That's not a very good premise for a movie, but no, no. but you know, Romeo and Juliet, there you go. Right. Yes. So that sounds plausible, but On the other hand, we also have people saying things like, well, when you get to paradise, you'll behold God and see the divine essence, and you'll be able to have God or at least have the most intimate relationship with God you possibly can. And you wouldn't want to say as a medieval theologian that at that point you stop loving God. And similarly, you don't stop loving, like if Romeo and Juliet had had a happier, spoiler alert, they don't get together at the end, they both die. <laughs> so if you imagine a kind of happy version of Romeo and Juliet, by the way, there are, I think that there are later versions of Romeo and Juliet where it was performed with a happy ending. Oh, wow. Like centuries later, so people were like, oh, centuries this is so later, sad. Yeah. No, we need to like, let's turn it into a happy need, ending. Yeah, so yeah, imagine yeah, a sure version thought, yeah. of Romeo and Juliet where they get married and they live happily ever after. So they kind of have each other at that point. Mm -hmm. The narrative is over. Like there's no more tension. There's no dilemma. Mm -hmm. But the love should actually remain, right? In fact, we might even think that people who have been married for a long time have some kind of deeper, richer love. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so that's, I think, an interesting question. Um, Plato in the symposium has a pretty strong tendency to suggest that erotic love, at least, really turns very much on the idea of desiring someone you don't have yet or something mm-hmm. that you don't have yet. And it's not so clear that Eros would still be the right way to talk about an attitude that someone has for something they've already got, mm-hmm. right? Actually, philia might be better, right? So mm-hmm. philia sounds like a very stable thing and it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound nearly as much like it presupposes some kind of desire or lack of fulfillment, right? Because two people who are mm-hmm. friends, let's say, or a mother and their daughter, a mother and her daughter, say, um, they, these seem like stable, long lasting relationships that don't involve lack or need or, or unmet desire. Mm-hmm. So I think that's actually a really interesting question is, um, I, I see you know, that. I mean, that's, that, that is uh, really interesting for me. It seems that it's uh, at least there is, there would be a desire to maintain, uh, uh that stability, of that love so there will be uh, still that with 
of course, like in the afterlife that, that, that you described, that would be like an eternal sort of situation mm-hmm. where it's kind of never ending. Um, uh, but at the same time, like uh, when you have that kind of stability, you desire for that stability to remain yeah, stable. That's actually a point that's made in yeah. these Renaissance dialogues I was talking mm-hmm. about. So I think, I think it's in a dialogue by Leone Ebreo, who's a Jewish mm-hmm. Renaissance philosopher. There's, so they're talking about this and they, they come up with one of the solutions to the problem that they come up with is, well, mm-hmm. when you say you have something that doesn't exclude that you want to keep desiring to have, you want to, you, sorry, mm-hmm. you desire to keep having it, right? So you to don't keep want to having it, it yes. and you can't ever yes. finish that because you're that always like in the, sort of looking yes. to the future and the mm-hmm. possibility of loss means that your, your desire to have it forever is never yet fulfilled. Um, yes. even, but even then there would be puzzles about, for example, how God could love us, yes. right? Because God can't yes. possibly how, how be lacking. Yes, how to describe that love? What kind of a love is that? Because mm-hmm. uh, that, you're quite right. We, need to be, we enter that territory when we kind of, we cannot see it from the other side. Uh, but, but this desire for, um, that which you don't have, even in those, in the Socratic dialogues, when the, uh, when it's described as a desire for uh, that which you don't have, which is wisdom, like in the, in the younger man, uh, and, and this desire for wisdom, for beauty and all those things is kind of never ending, uh, because you can never really have enough of it. It's, it's, uh, and it can never be exhausted in, in it. Mm-hmm. In, in a way uh so there is that kind of always you're always reaching into it's almost like the cosmos is always expanding and you're reaching out and it keeps expanding and the more the more you get the more it's expanded uh in in front of you uh, that i think is one um, thing that plato did think was defective about physical love so just like sex mm-hmm. because he thinks of sex as being very much like uh eating and drinking mm-hmm. so it's really about temporary desire satisfaction he has this image in another dialogue called the gorgias where he says that people who are trying to pursue physical pleasures all the time are like people who are trying to fill jars with uh, liquid like water and there are holes in the jar so they keep trying to pour water in and the whole time the water is pouring back out right and that could apply to something like sex or eating right so you you eat and you're full or you have sex and you're satisfied, but then like the next day you have to do it again. Right. Indeed. So it's like this yes. constant chasing of their satisfaction that you can never really get. Whereas yes. with philosophical wisdom, once you had it, have it, you're done. You've got it. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like having a sealed jar that has no holes in it, as Plato says. It has no holes in it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, this just kind of made me think of, uh, I forgot the name now, but the, the pre-Socratic who uh, was uh, an ascetic uh, hedonist who, uh, who didn't like, uh, who, who thought that the pl- uh, pleasure is uh, the absence of pain. So I think he would kind of uh, appreciate this, um, like uh, he wouldn't have sex uh, or uh, because that would require... You mean that would, Epicurus, Epicurus. Yeah, he's actually not yes. a pre-Socratic. He's slightly after. Oh, he's not pre-Socratic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes, my bad. Yeah. Yeah, so he's, um, he's actually a hedonist who's taking account of Plato's critique of hedonism. So uh, what's yes, happening there is that's that he, he's thought about, okay, how would hedonism work if what I'm after is something like stability and like the easiest way of, I want to sort of formulate my desires so that they're as easy to satisfy as possible. So he's yes. got a hedonism, which involves things like learning to get by on very simple and very little food and drink. Right. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, that it's, it's, uh, it's so fun. I don't know. I, I kind of liked that, uh, that uh, idea. I don't know how it functions, how it would function at all, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I kind of imagine that, uh, that type of a, uh, of a person, uh, you know, and with that kind of contradiction uh at, at this school um so um to to move on uh, when aristotle takes over uh and uh, he is as as you yourself said uh, well and i agree with you the you know greatest philosopher of all, all times he should be top one not karl marx or whoever it was that uh, that uh, topped those charts uh, when they when they did uh, uh, the polls, 
uh, son, I'm curious, like, so he wanted to categorize everything. He was really meticulous and all that. So what is, uh, as you, uh, you said, that he leaves Eros behind. So uh, he only co continues with uh, Philia. Can you say something about uh, Aristotle's uh, notion of love and how he develops it mm -hmm. and what he yeah, claims? Yeah, I mean, it might not be true to say that he says nothing about Eros, but he mm -hmm. doesn't have like long stretches of a work that are devoted to Eros the way that Plato wrote the symposium. Mm -hmm. He actually, by the way, says a lot about reproduction because he wrote about biology and he wrote an entire work called Generation of Animals. It's not very sexy but it's all about <laughs> like the biological side of reproduction. But um, what he does do is he writes several, uh, he, he writes a, a whole bunch of material about friendship, which become several books in the Nicomachean ethics, which is his main ethical work. And in these, he describes different kinds of friendship and kind of compares them and talks about what the best kind of friendship is and what would be defective kinds of friendship. So he was really interested in that. And I guess um, to sort of anticipate the same question, like why would he be interested in, why would he be interested in that? I think the reason is that he understands the best life to be the subject of ethics. So he talks about how ethics is the search for happiness, eudaimonia. And then he just assumes that, in fact, he says at one point explicitly that no one could be having a truly happy life without friends. So if you were, for example, alone on a desert island, then you could exhibit lots of virtues, maybe like fortitude and self-control and courage, perhaps. Um, but you couldn't be living the fullest human life and most perfect human life possible because the fullest human life would involve friendship. Yes, the, uh, uh, it, it, what comes to mind right now as you were, as you were describing this, uh, there are all those uh, stories or movies about castaways. Uh, and usually there is always a need for, for friendship, uh, for someone, uh, to, uh, to share, you know, that everyday life with. Uh, and the, the, the scene that comes to mind is actually one without people, but there is only one character. I think it's called Castaway with Tom Hanks. Where he talks where to the volleyball. He, where he talks to the volleyball, he draws a face on uh, on the ball, and that immediately becomes a character. So, uh, so that it almost kind of shows this great need for uh, friendship for someone to share your life with, yeah, uh, even if it's an imagination. <laughs> he would have liked that scene. Yes, uh, I c I can imagine. So uh, you, the way you explain it, it uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, 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 I really like it. Um, uh, is there uh, more we can say about uh, just generally about, you know, uh, Greek love <laughs> or the uh, love in Greek philosophies and kind of uh, to, um, to sum it up or to, to wrap it up or, to, to, or maybe to anticipate where it's going to go? I mean, in which direction is it going to take off in, in, in the future? Right. Well, if we go ahead to late antiquity, mm -hmm. we have... Uh, theories of love developing in the Platonic tradition, sometimes directly responding to the symposium and other things that Plato wrote about this. For example, the founder of Neoplatonism, Plotinus, who lives in the third century BC. So now we're like half a millennium later than Aristotle. He has uh, some of his writings directly respond to Plato's discussions of love. And he has a whole treatise about Eros. Um, Actually, a former student of mine, Dimitrios Vasilakis, wrote a book about this, which is quite interesting. Um, and one of the things he's worrying about is this idea that Eros is somehow needy or lacking, because it would sort of imply that it can't be a divine force that's, you know, involved in the intelligible realm, which is the, what, exactly what he thinks it is. Mm -hmm. So he's got he's one of the philosophers who comes to grips with that difficulty. But then I think the more obvious thing that happens starting in late antiquity is that it's really in late antiquity, so as of, say, the fourth century or so, that philosophy starts becoming Christianized. And so this is well before the medieval period, right? I mean, depending on when you think the medieval period starts. Mm -hmm. But in patristic literature, like in Greek theologians, for example, you already have thematization of love, where on the one hand, they've got this biblical concept of love, like God is a loving father, and then the other hand, they've got all these Greek pagan ideas about love, especially from Plato. 
and they have to try to make them fit together, which is difficult for reasons we've already said, right? So um, it's not so clear what it would mean to say that God loves his creatures from a platonic point of view. Like what, mm -hmm. what is the desire there that yes. God wants to fulfill? It doesn't seem like anything that could happen in the created world would make God's life better, right? And there, you kind of have an intuition that if God didn't create the world at all, he'd just be fine, right? He would, he didn't, we wouldn't say, we don't really want to say as Christians or Muslims or Jews, oh, well, God created the world because if he didn't create the world, he'd be less happy. It yeah. seems like a very Indeed, counterintuitive thing to say. That seems, would be very counter, counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But on the other hand, yeah. if he doesn't, if that's not why he did it, why did he do it? Mm. Right. Yes. Well, the, the, that move, uh, that desire comes from that to, uh, to do that, to, uh, to go from, I, uh, I find that really, really fascinating. There is, of course, you know, sometimes in, in, especially in Sufi thought and, uh, some other thought that is, um, ideas, you know, why, uh, why God even wanted to create, uh, that there is, uh, uh, that notion of, um, uh, the hidden treasure, I think in the Sufi thought uh, that God was a hidden treasure and wanted to be known uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm. Yeah, that's one of Ibn Arabi's favorite. That's lines. Ibn Arabi's, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Something else, though, that goes on in late antiquity and medieval philosophy is a kind of uh, discussion that recalls where we started with, which is Empedocles, which is to think about love in a broader sense that is more like a natural phenomenon that's found throughout nature. So for example, the most important philosopher of the Islamic world in Sina, who is usually called Avicenna in English, because that's mm -hmm. what it was, he was called in Latin. He wrote a work called Risalat fil Ishq, which means letter on love. Mm -hmm. And Ishq, that Arabic word really means eros. So it's about erotic love or you know passionate love, not philia. Uh -huh. And in this, epistle about love he talks about love as this sort of maximally general phenomenon which just explains why all natural things do what they do so even things like the elements moving the way they do like fire moving up earth moving down or plants growing or animals pursuing their natural tendencies mm -hmm. he takes all of that to be examples of love because he's he's really sort of taken the concept of love and as we've seen, this is kind of a tendency throughout tradition, the tradition, but he does it really explicitly. He says, well, love is just any time that you're pursuing any kind of drive, right? And you don't even have to be doing it consciously, right? It could be the elements pursuing their natural places or whatever. Um, and so actually, I mean, this is an interesting view because the thing that leaps to mind for us, which is like romantic love or sexual love, just becomes like a very specific instance of a very general phenomenon. So a human's mm -hmm. desire to reproduce, for example, through sex is really just our version of what plants do when they grow or what rocks do when they fall, right? It's yeah. just everything following its natural tendency. And one implication of that is that, um, I mean, in some ways, sexual love becomes a less special thing, but also it becomes something that it would be really strange to have a pejorative view about. So like this other thing we've been talking about, sort of ascetic, like nervousness about sexual love, where like the platonic love would be better and we kind of downplay yes. or try to get yes. away from sexual love. That's something Ibn Sina would think was very weird, I guess. And in fact, in the Islamic world, one of the things we see happening is that Muslims polemicize against Christians for embracing the ideal of charity as a kind of the, as the best life. And Muslims are like, what are you talking about? God gave us sexuality. It has a purpose. It's great. You know, yeah. you know, you guys are sort of hung up neurotics who, if your views were taken seriously, would wind up extinguishing the human race because no one would have any children. Right. So there's a, there's a medieval debate about chastity and erotic or sexual love and which one is better as it were. Yes, absolutely, and uh, you know that uh, that makes sense, and I uh, and I see that, and it's quite a beautiful thought that from uh, Avicenna, from Ibn Sina, uh, and this idea of uh, 
the law as uh, an, an overarching kind of principle and these uh, specific kinds are kind of uh, feeding into it. So, so uh, plants just growing and me just uh, growing. And uh, there is actually, uh, I know this, that in uh, Islam, there's also the idea that uh, making love um, uh, is uh, part of uh, worship uh, as a kind of a dhikr uh, of, of sorts. Uh, so I, I don't I don't know if a lot of people think of that as like oh I'm going to worship God I'm going to have sex with my wife but uh, in a sense it's kind of embedded in that that kind of thinking mm -hmm. yeah and you can see uh, that it, in some ways it it makes a lot of sense within this more abstract generalized way of thinking about love yes. right yes um, uh, to uh, this, this was really amazing, uh, Peter. I, I, I love this uh, discussion so much, and uh, I think we could stretch in uh, so many different directions. And uh, uh, and as you do, at at some point, you actually branch <laughs> into two podcasts uh, because you know when you go to India and uh, stay uh, in Europe at that that point in your um, um, uh, in your in your production. Uh, it is just so much, and obviously, uh, it's impossible to to fill all the gaps. Uh, especially this 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 podcast doesn't have that aspiration, doesn't have a desire to <laughs> to fill all the gaps as yours, which is which is really amazing. Uh, but I actually want to end on um, asking you personally, uh, as a philosopher. You know, what is love for Professor Adamson? Oh, gosh. What does it mean that you love entirely different categories of things like giraffes, puns, and basakitan, mm -hmm. and all these things? So I know I'm, this is a little bit cheeky, but I would really like to hear. Yeah. So there is this kind of casual way where we talk about loving coffee or loving action movies or whatever. And I think that in a way that trivializes the relationship that you have to other people. And in fact, I'm a little bit reluctant to go along with this thing that you get in the platonic tradition or in Encina, for example, where love becomes this maximally general phenomenon, which just explains all kind of uh, teleological behavior in nature. So in other words, goal-directed behavior mm -hmm. in nature, because I think that there is something unique about love where what you're interested in is the particular person who you love. And you don't love them because they're just an example of some more general phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you might say, well, you know, I love my wife. And if I'm challenged to explain why, I may say something like, well, she's got a really good sense of humor, right? Mm -hmm. But that in, even that kind of suggests that, you know, any other woman with a good sense of humor would have been fine. <laughs> so I was just yes. sort of looking for, so I, you know, I'm looking for a, a mate with the following 17 properties. Oh, you, you have... <laughs> 16 out of the 17, you'll do, right? <laughs> so, I mean, this can't be how it works, right? And I, I think that that kind of, this is something that people have often talked about with Plato, by the way, and whether it would be a fair accusation to make of him, but it's a tendency we find in philosophical theories of love to think of love as just involving having a beloved object that satisfies certain needs or desires. And I think that love is more irreducibly particular or personal than that. So mm -hmm. for example, imagine you're in love with someone and if you're asked why you say something about their sense of humor and then, yeah. you know, like they hit their head and they lose their sense of humor, you don't stop loving yes, them. Yes, exactly. You don't stop loving them. And so exactly. there's a kind of, yes. uh, I mean, love is, I think it's something a little bit more mysterious than mm -hmm. that. It's not that someone kind of does it for you in the sense of, having the properties or features you're interested in that satisfy some of your needs or desires. It's rather that you've formed a bond with them that can survive changes in what they're like. Or, I mean, think about children, right? So you, you know, yes. you love your baby and then you love the 25 year old version of that baby. They have nothing in common yes. at all. They um, have nothing in common at all. So it's much yeah. more like a, um, an emotional bond between two individuals mm -hmm. who really have to be the individuals they are. And I think that's actually quite philosophically puzzling. It's like a deep problem about love, why it that works. It really is. It, it really is uh, because it's something we know uh, exists. 
but to explain it, to analyze it, it becomes really, really. And this, uh, I mean, the, the problems that arise uh, uh, far uh, more than in uh, practically any other philosophical problem. <laughs> That, that we can discuss, but you, you described it so beautifully. I like that, uh, how you say it, 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 it is an answer to this kind of particularity uh, of um, rather than, uh, uh, than a generality, than, rather than a category, rather than an idea, a form. Uh, so it kind of really bringing it down to, to a specific moment in time, history. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, this is why you should not be happy if you are told by your loved one, oh, you're such a great instantiation of the form of beauty. And that's exactly. not what we're <laughs> That's after. not going to do it. <laughs> that is not going to do it. No. But I just discovered, you know, buying my wife uh, chestnuts seems to work every time. Chestnuts? She Chestnuts. Yeah. She she loves, you know, roasted chestnuts. Oh, those ones they sell on the street in, in on Europe the streets, in winter. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are pretty Yes, cool. yeah. Yes, they're very good. They're really popular. Okay. And uh, they're very expensive here in Sweden. So it's practically like buying a perfume or expensive clothes. <laughs> so, so I get a lot of love for uh, chestnuts. Okay. Yes. I mean, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for this uh, uh, amazing conversation. I, I loved it so much and I didn't, I, I, um, I, I didn't expect less. I mean, just knowing your work and uh, your mind and, uh, you know, what you've uh, done, it's just a pleasure to kind of follow you all the time and, uh, and continuously kind of to, uh, see what, um, uh, what you do in your own uh, podcast. And I recommend it to everyone. I hope everyone will uh, listen to every single episode. Uh, I know it will take a couple of years, maybe. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, uh, but still, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for, for having me. On. Uh, You're satisfying my spirited soul and its desire for honor. So thank you very much. Oh, that's that. amazing. That is that is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that comment. <laughs>